Hello, my name is Debbie Sauceville. I've been a volunteer speaker and victim advocate for Mothers Against Drunk Driving for more than 15 years. I joined MAD because of my 16-year-old stepdaughter, Lauren Grace Sauceville. Lauren was a junior in high school. She had been a cheerleader. She was an average student, terrible in math. Uh, she was very social, but she was also shy with adults. Lauren had her driver's license, that drive by yourself, be so independent for three weeks before Friday, December the 3rd, 2004 rolled around. I regret to this day that I worked late that night because I didn't get to see her again alive. Every time she took her dad's car out, he would say, Lauren, don't drink and drive. Don't drink and drive. And on this particular night when he said that, her response was, Dad, I'm the designated driver tonight. Which is really silly because if you're 16 or under 21, for that matter, then you should be qualified to be a designated driver. Now that night, we knew she was going to a friend's house. But what we didn't know was the dad was out of town. And this is an open invitation for an unsupervised underage party, to which our Lauren brought two cases of beer. Now when we heard that, it may sound naive, but we thought to ourselves, how does a 16-year-old get a hold of two cases of beer? Truth be told, two-thirds of high school juniors and seniors claim that they can buy it themselves. Lauren didn't fall into that category. Lauren was part of the one-third of kids who are provided alcohol by an adult. And in Lauren's case, a 27-year-old man whom she knew, whose house she'd been to for parties. I shudder. So Lauren went to this party, and there were eight or ten kids, and they sat around for a few hours and they drank. But those two cases of beer were not the only alcohol at that party. They decided after a few hours that they were going to go to another party in a town nearby. Irony number one of that Friday night was that the party had already been shut down by the police but the kids didn't know that. Now, we used to always joke about Lauren's terrible sense of direction. She had no idea where she was going, and I think partly because, you know, if you drive there, then you can remember how to get there. But she was only three weeks with the license, so she hadn't driven too many places by herself. So in order to get to this other party, she had to follow a friend of hers. And we found out later that the friend was actually racing with Lauren's old boyfriend to see who could get to that party first. The old boyfriend went straight. The boy Lauren was following turned left on a street called Colchester Road. Colchester Road is a very dark and very windy road. The speed limit is 35 miles an hour. Now I can only guess what went through Lauren's head that night and I believe that she thought, if I lose him, I am truly lost. She had no idea where she was, even though she was only about four miles from our house. So the police tell me that Lauren was doing 55 miles an hour when she crested a slight hill and stopped at the stop sign waiting for her was her friend. Now. She's very inexperienced, and she is drunk. And she overreacted. She hit the embankment with her dad's 1999 Ford Explorer, flipped it onto the driver's side, and skidded down the road toward her friend, who saw it all happening in his rearview mirror. And he tried to get out of the way. But it was just too fast, too short of a distance. And so Lauren ended up smashing into the right rear bumper of his Mazda. With such force, the roof crushed in on her 
and pushed her seat belted in the driver's seat into the rear passenger compartment of the vehicle. Lauren was killed instantly from blunt trauma to the head. Every window in this car broke. Her purse flew out the window. The beer she was bringing, the leftover beer from the party, flew out the window. One of her shoes flew off. Have you ever seen a single shoe on the side of the road and wondered, I used to always wonder how that happened. Now I know I can't stand, I can't stand to see a single shoe on the side of the road. I don't even like to see a white SUV. Number two irony of the night is that Lauren Grace Sauceville died next to a dead end sign. And a dead end is exactly where you are headed if you drink and drive. Or dead like Lauren. And let me tell you something. Dead is the worst four-letter word you can ever use when it refers to a child, anyone's child. I did not give birth to her, no, but I was a mother to her for nine years, and I loved her. Standing next to the car here, and it is dark, but it was night, is Detective Benachowski. He is with the Police Crash Reconstruction Unit. And it is his and his partner's horrific job, in my opinion, to have to go to the houses of families and let them know that their loved one is never coming home, ever. Lauren died a little before 11 o'clock that night. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her curfew was 1230. It took them an hour to cut her out of the car, and she was pronounced dead at the scene. Now, my daughter Shannon and I had fallen asleep downstairs watching TV that night, and around 2 o'clock, we woke up and we hauled ourselves upstairs to bed. Shannon went in her room, I went in our bedroom, and my husband was semi-awake. And because I'd already had a new driver with a curfew, I looked out that front window to make sure the car was in the driveway. And it wasn't. So I said to my husband, honey, Lauren's not home. And he said, I know. I've been calling her cell phone and I keep getting the voicemail. And so that's what we did. Called the cell phone, got the voicemail, called the cell phone, got the voicemail. Around 3 o'clock in the morning, Detective Banachowski and his partner went to Lauren's mom and stepdad's house because that's the address that was on her driver's license. Even though she lived with us full time, as did her sister Rachel and as did my daughter Shannon. Somewhere around 3.15 to 3.30 that morning, our phone rang. Now, when your phone rings in the middle of the night, it's jarring. But when your phone rings in the middle of the night and your child is late, your heart stops. And my husband jumped on that phone. And of course, all I could hear was his side of the conversation. And he said, yeah, yeah, no, but we're calling her cell phone and we keep getting voicemail and we're worried sick. And the next thing that happened, I will never forget as long as I live. My husband sat bolt upright in bed, turned completely ashen, looked at me and said, oh Jesus, she's dead. And the world went silent for me for a moment Never before and never since has that ever happened. And it didn't last long. I, I went into autopilot, started getting dressed, and I heard down the hall Shannon's door open. And so I went down. And she said, what's going on? 
and I said words that I never thought I would ever say. I said, honey, Lauren's been killed in a car accident. And I said accident back then. But after 15 plus years of being with Matt and going to conferences and training and meeting victims and survivors, Mad doesn't call it an accident. It is a crash, it is a collision, it is a wreck. But it is no accident when you combine drinking with getting behind the wheel of a car. Which, by the way, for the majority of us, will be the most dangerous weapon we ever have in our hands. And as I held my daughter sobbing in my arms, all she kept saying was, why didn't she call me? Why didn't she call me? Shannon was 20. She had run of the house. She could come and go as she pleased. And she had told Lauren, you get yourself in a situation, you call me, I will come and get you. The kids think they're invincible. And I think everyone at some point has been guilty of having the that won't happen to me mentality. Bad things happen to mean people or bad things happen to bad people. Not me. But I can tell you right now, it can and it did to us. We buried Lauren in a beautiful white and pink casket on December the 8th. 2004. It was a sunny day. There were 600 people at the funeral. Flowers were this high on the grave. A white hearse was her last ride. On the morning of the funeral, Shannon gave me an envelope to put in the casket with Lauren. And there was a lump in the middle of it. And I said, honey, what did you put in here? And she said, it's my class ring because Lauren will never get one. There's a lot of things Lauren Grace Sauceville never got. She didn't graduate in 2006, didn't go to college, didn't get a car of her own, didn't get married. My husband will never walk his firstborn down the aisle. She uh, missed out on all of that. She didn't get to be an aunt to uh, Shannon's two kids and to Rachel's kids. She wasn't a bridesmaid at either of their weddings. Missed out, and her family has missed out on it every single day since. Who knows what, what kind of a person she would have become, what her life could have held in store for her. Lauren made a mistake that night. And she paid for that mistake with her life. She became a statistic. Her blood alcohol concentration at the time it was taken was a 0.13. Her spinal fluid was a 0.17. So I believe that she could have been as high as a 0.2. And the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says that a driver with a 0.15 or higher blood alcohol concentration is 300 times more likely to be involved in a fatal crash. That was Lauren. The last we saw her, this beautiful hair had already lost its luster and was falling out. Those gorgeous eyes were sewn shut. And that smile and her laugh were gone forever because her mouth was sewn shut too. Now, I said at the beginning that I was a volunteer speaker and victim advocate. And the victim advocacy that I do for MAD is taking phone calls on the MAD helpline. The MAD helpline is staffed by MAD National during business hours, Monday through Friday. After hours and on weekends, people like myself take phone calls all over the country. And early on in my MAD helpline days, it was a Sunday morning around 
and my mad phone rang. And it was a mother whose daughter had been hit by a drunk driver just two days earlier on a Friday night. And the daughter wasn't badly hurt, but she was seriously traumatized by the incident. And we spoke for about 20 or 30 minutes. And in that time, the mom kept saying, if she hadn't gone out that night, if the light hadn't been red, if the driver had been paying attention, and if, and if. And I finally said to her, you know, you say if, and I say, if only. If only the police had been in Lauren's path that night to stop her, she'd probably still be with us. If only that man had not bought the beer for her. If only her boyfriend, before they left for that party, had not given her four shots of vodka to boost up her blood alcohol concentration. If only someone had taken her keys that night. If only. In these 15 plus years, I have spoken live to more than 15,000 people. And I'm sure that a lot of them, and perhaps you, thought to themselves, why does she do this? Why does she come in front of complete strangers and relate this horrific story? Pity? No, I don't need your pity. Pity is just another four-letter word. How about money? No, I'm a volunteer. I willingly volunteer my time, my gas, my heart to MAD and our cause. So why? I do it because right here, right now, I need you to get it. I need you to understand that this is the consequence of drunk driving. This beautiful young girl with her whole life ahead of her, she and the 10,000 plus people who are killed every year in drunk driving crashes, and the 250,000 plus people who are traumatically injured. They're the consequence of drunk driving. Not getting pulled over by the police, having to walk a line, blowing in a breathalyzer, getting handcuffed, sitting in the back seat of a police car, going before a magistrate, spending some time in jail, spending a lot of money on a lawyer, losing your license possibly. No. No. That's an inconvenience. This they, the victims and the survivors, are the consequence of drunk driving, this 100% preventable cause of death. Now I'm going to leave you with some words from a Led Zeppelin song called Stairway to Heaven. It's a classic song. I've heard it thousands of times. Love it. And I don't expect you to remember my name. I don't expect you to remember Lauren's name. But I do hope that if you hear this song, when you hear this song, you'll think about what you heard today. You'll remember. And the words are, yes, there are two paths you can go by, but in the long run, there's still time to change the road you're on. I'm asking you to make it a safe road. Or as the song later says, the piper will be calling you to join him, just like Lauren.